So we were discussing the families of viruses. There are five families. The smallest viruses belong to Parvo and the largest viruses generally belong to Pox viridae. Viridae is the family of viruses. You need to remember the first name, Pox viruses, for example. And here in the smallpox family, so, so I told you smallpox is a disease and uh, it is a dread, uh, it is a very harmful or very dangerous disease actually. So this, these particular viruses are having four closely related viruses in this family, out of, out of which the smallpox virus is uh, the largest virus known, right? So actually the smallpox is a disease and the virus which is responsible for this particular disease is called variola virus. No problem, Ankit. I have, star uh, have started recording in this particular class. No worries. So now, uh, okay, so you need to remember this particular table because it is going to help you uh, to find whether it is having RNA or DNA or whether it is single or double stranded, right? So first two families, that is Picorna and Orthomyxoviridae, they are having RNA genome and both are having single standard versions of their RNA, right? The Parvoviridae, as I told you, this is having the smallest virus, that is polio virus. So let me write here also, so you will get it. Or sometimes uh, an indirect question is generally asked because we know the polio virus is the smallest virus. And actually, sometimes we forget that it belongs to Parvoviridae, right? So this can be asked indirectly. You need to remember this belongs to Parvoviridae and it is having the single standard DNA version of okay, their genomes. Thus, okay, so first thing is their size. Second is nucleic acid, whether it is RNA or DNA. So first two families are having RNA genome. Last three are having Parvo, Adeno, and Pox Verde are having DNA genome. Now, strandedness is also important. So the first two families are single stranded RNA. Third, Parvo Verde is actually having single stranded DNA, and then they are having double stranded DNA. So you can see the complexity is increasing in this order if you move from left to right, right? So then the, the next thing which is important in classification of viruses is the symmetry of their capsid. I will share uh, one image. Actually, I'm not able to upload here uh, after the class. It will uh, tell you actually the how many different type of symmetries can be possible in case of viruses. So they can have icosahedral symmetry, helical symmetry, or a complex symmetry. And generally, these classes are recognized depending upon their capsid symmetry or the protein coat they are having uh, their genome inside, right? Now there is one more thing which is important that is enveloped viruses. So mostly uh, you can classify viruses into two groups. One is enveloped viruses, one is called naked viruses. What is enveloped viruses? Enveloped viruses are those viruses which are actually having an envelope uh, outside their nucleocapsid. So you understand uh, that there is a protein coat that is called capsid. Inside the capsid, there is a genome, whether it is DNA or RNA, doesn't matter. Uh, then it is actually outside this nucleocapsid, some viruses having the envelope. So this envelope is actually the host membrane, host cell membrane, in which this particular virus is performing infection. So it take the, uh, during the process of uh, coming out of the host cell, it take the some part of the plasma membrane as an envelope. So those viruses which can have this envelope are called enveloped viruses, whereas the rest of the three families are called naked viruses, right? So polioviruses are smallest because they are naked viruses. They do not have this envelope outside their nucleocapsid. Whereas orthomyxoviridae, which is a single stranded RNA, and the double stranded DNA, poxviridae, which are the largest known viruses, are enveloped viruses, right? Now there are uh, host strains is also important. So these families which are given in this table all are having animals uh, as their host and therefore they are all animal viruses, right?
Bacteriophages are bacterial viruses. So in this table, they have only given the animal viruses, right? So now we need to discuss few basic points about viruses. Okay, I need to remove this, how this is. Fine, so from our discussion, we know uh, that viruses are simple non-cellular entities and they are obligate intracellular. You need to remember intracellular means they are inside the cell, parasites. So if someone asks you what one, which one of the following are intracellular parasites, so viruses, because other parasites are generally extracellular. Viruses are smaller than prokaryotic cells or bacteria ranging in size 0.02 to 0.3 micron in micrometer or micron simply. Uh, bacteria is generally having a size range uh, around one micrometer, but uh, viruses, the smallpox virus is the largest virus known that is having diameter around 200 nanometer. So they are having dimensions in nanometer. Uh, and nanometer is equal to 10 to power minus 9 meter, right? And is 1 micron is equal to 10 to power minus 6. So you need to remember these units also. So this is 10 to power 9 meter. Then the smallest virus is polio virus, which is the smallest virus. And it is around 28 nanometer. You will find some, uh, in some books, it is written around 30 nanometer, but it is completely okay. So it is around 30 nanometer. For the simplicity, it is uh, written like this. A fully assembled infectious virus, which is present outside the cell, extracellular, that is called virion. So now you need to remember what is the difference between these two terms, virus and virion. So viruses are intracellular parasites. They are present inside the cell. And vir viron is actually the fully assembled infectious viral particle which can exist outside the uh, cell, which can infect that particular cell, right? So the main function of the, this particle is to deliver its genome, whether it is DNA or RNA genome into the host cell so that the genome can be expressed. What is the meaning of expression? First of all, it will be transcribed, means uh, the mRNA will be synthesized out of it and then translated means the protein will polypeptide will be made out of this mRNAs. So these proteins are generally making the coat of that particular virus, the capsomeres or the capsid uh, coat of that virus. Uh, each viral species has a very limited host range. Now this is important and actually I, I was discussing about this. Actually each virus is having a close host range, very limited uh, host range, that is, it can reproduce only a small group of closely related species. Right. So this factor is important and it will decide, the host range factor will decide uh, in how many closely related species the virus can perform the infection. Now, viral structure, so you can uh, classify viruses depending upon their size, their shape, their chemical composition. As we have discussed, two types of viruses, one is smallpox and uh, the second one is polio virus. So, see here, I'm going to show you the structures as well. So this is a smallpox virus. This is having some brick shape. Uh, okay, so you can see these are some brick shape like particles, smallpox viruses, and they are enveloped, right? They are having a plasma membrane coat outside their nucleocapsid, which actually they have taken from the host plasma membrane. The second type of viruses, are uh, Ankit is having one query, uh, virion survive outside of the cell. 
uh, generally viruses are the connecting link between the living and non-living. Generally, they are a non-living when they are present outside the living cells. But actually, what is what do you mean by survival? Survival is including uh, metabolism and all these events means replicating their genome. That is only possible when they infect a living cell, right? So inside intracellular only they can perform their metabolism and all other activities. Outside the cell, they are non-living uh, organism. You can call them particles, right? Second type of viruses, so one is smallpox. These are the largest known viruses and they come under the family of pox viridae which is having double stranded DNA and they are enveloped, right? Then there is a second family that is Pox Verde. Oh, sorry, Parvo Verde. And in this family, actually, you have So before moving into the polio virus, let me tell you something which is actually very important. And you know, they are largest viruses, right? So they are having sizes something around 200 nanometer. In fact, there are uh, some variation in size. So you can even have, uh, so these are variola virus. They are having large brick shaped viruses. They are having approximately 300 and 350 nanometers and the variations mean 250 to 70 nanometer around. Now the second thing is they are having four closely related uh, viruses which can infect the humans as well. So one is variola virus which will uh, which will cause uh, this disease, smallpox, which is very dreadful disease. Then vaccinia virus. So cowpox virus and monkeypox virus. They are closely related uh, ortho, uh, orthopox viruses that can cause infection in humans as well because you know uh, these are closely related species, monkey and humans. So therefore they can perform infection in both. Rikita is saying my voice is breaking. Okay, it can break because uh, the internet is not fixed, but you can reconnect. I do not know uh, the internet problem can be on your side also. Okay, so these closely related viruses can infect the humans as well. Uh, now, the second one is polio viruses, which are the smallest known viruses, and you will show they are having this kind of structure. They are ball shaped and they are naked viruses. They do not have envelope over them. And uh, you will see these yellow color uh, structures. Here also it is given. So what is important points which you need to remember about polio virus? So polio virus are the causative agents of polio, right? And we know there are two vaccines. So generally the question has been asked from the vaccine part. So polio viruses are, uh, can be used to make two types of vaccines. One is called injectable vaccine that is inactivated actually, the Salk vaccine. And the second type is the attenuated version of this virus. So the attenuated version that is also called live attenuated vaccine is uh, actually called Sabin, right? So I will tell you the two type of vaccines. Uh, so since we are uh, discussing polio virus, to treat polio virus, uh, polio disease, the two type of vaccines is being used. One is called IPV, 
that is inactivated polio virus and this inactivated polio virus one question has been asked from this particular section how uh, the virus is being inactivated when they prepare this inactivated polio vaccine so this was the question so you need to remember uh, they generally use formalin uh, to inactivate the polio virus right and then they will inject this preparation uh, using an injection so this is called injectable form of vaccine or the sarc vaccine right so simply you need to remember sarc vaccine is an inactivated vaccine and which the formalin is being being used and the second type is attenuated so this type of uh, is also called opb or the attenuated or the oral polio vaccine so these type of attenuated vaccines are being used in which have the live attenuated version of the polio virus okay so these are called sabin vaccines so because uh, albert sabin have discovered these particular uh, attenuated version of this vaccine polio vaccine right so if someone ask you sabin vaccine then it is live attenuated vaccine if someone ask you sarc vaccine then this is inactivated polio vaccine and this is the injectable version of this particular vaccine which is inactivating the virus with the help of formalin and they have using th three uh, types of polio virus mahani mef1 and sarc8 right details you can read from the wikipedia they are having uh, they have written everything here now the next what we were discussing so depending upon their size the shape and chemical composition you can classify the viruses into several families okay all viruses have a nucleocapsid composed of nucleic acid surrounded by a protein capsid so this is the basic structure of all the viruses they generally have this nucleocapsid which is composed of a nucleic acid genome and which is surrounded by a protein capsid or coat as you can see here also since it, these are viruses of bacteria so they are having this head like structure and the tail region this is lambda phase so they are having uh, this capsid or the coat inside the head region they are having their genome which is double stranded dna uh, which is 49 clobase pair in length similarly the filamentous uh, bacteriophage that is m13 uh, it is also having this capsid coat which is having the genome inside that is dna molecule which is single stranded in this case so this is the basic feature of almost all the viruses they are having a nucleocapsid a uh, capsid protein coat in which they generally have their genome and the genome can be dna rna single stranded or double stranded okay or fragmented also in some cases as we will discuss myco uh, viruses so we will discuss the segmented versions of their genome right so now so here we were capsids are formed as a single or double protein shell that consist of only one or few structural protein species uh the proteins used to build the capsid are called capsomeres so you need to note some terms but uh, they are simple you can remember them capsomeres for example and then capsid and nucleocapsid these three terms we have faced then there are two type of viruses one is called enveloped viruses second one is called as naked viruses so it is written here naked viruses and enveloped viruses right so enveloped viruses and then we have naked viruses now what is the difference between these two i already told you that enveloped viruses are those viruses which having an extra membranous envelope outside their nucleocapsid 
from where this envelope is coming this is coming from the host plasma membrane so if you compare the composition of these viral uh, envelopes and the host plasma membrane you will find that they are having the exact same composition whereas those viruses which do not have this envelope outside their nucleocapsid they are termed as nig viruses in enveloped viruses the nucleocapsid is surrounded by a lipid bilayer and glycoprotein which is derived from the modified host cell membrane so whenever a virus is infecting an organism uh, it can take its plasma membrane some portion of its plasma membrane and uh, it can modify this particular plasma host plasma membrane and this will become the envelope of this particular virus and this will give rise to a completely different class of viruses those are called as enveloped viruses now the enveloped viruses also having papillomeres what are papillomeres uh, capsid sorry capsomeres and papillomers they are different terms though both ending in mers so mers are for the uh, version of if they are present in more than uh, one unit so right so capsomeres are the subunits which are making this capsid right these are the protein which are making this capsid coat of virus whereas papillomeres are uh, these enveloped viruses which are taking the host cell membrane uh, often exhibit a fringe of glycoprotein spikes so you can uh, see that these particular viruses or enveloped viruses they are having glycoprotein spikes in their plasma membrane and these spikes are called papillomers in viruses the that acquire their envelope by budding through the plasma membrane or another intracellular cell membrane the lipid composition is very very much uh, closely similar or it will reflect that particular host membrane so there are two processes of taking the membrane either these viruses will uh, come out of the uh, come out of the uh, organism cell by the budding process or they can take the plasma membrane from intracellular uh, membranes we have several intracellular membrane for example nuclear membrane or the golgi bot golgi apparatus and endoplasmic reticulum okay so these intracellular uh, membrane system can also provide the membrane to that particular virus so when it will lyse the that particular cell it will have a membrane over it and then it will be regarded as enveloped viruses these are also having some spikes so these glycoprotein spikes are called papillomers which is the characteristic feature of some enveloped viruses now the second important thing is viral genome so we can divide we can classify viruses depending upon their genome and you need to remember the viruses are generally having smaller size genomes so priyanshi is having one uh, query why these naked viruses do not take up the host plasma membrane on infection because they are having different strategy right so they are called naked viruses because they are they do not have envelope if they also have envelopes then we should also call them enveloped viruses and there should be no classification depending upon the presence of envelope so this is the feature of these different families of viruses as i showed you in the table there is only two families in animal viruses which is showing this feature uh, okay so if you think of enveloped viruses so only orthomyxoviridae uh, which are having single stranded rna as their genome and the last one that is poxviridae which is which is having the largest viruses for example smallpox virus they are only having these envelopes otherwise other families generally do not having these envelopes right so now depending upon their genome uh, they can be classified generally they are having smaller genome size so you need to remember their genome size as well 
if you look into the table, you will find that the genome size is small in case of Parvo Vindi, uh, four to six globase pairs. Then Picorna Vindi, Orthomyxo Vindi, Adeno Vindi, they are having large genomes. Okay, but still, uh, the largest known size of genome is 375 KB. Okay, so which is still uh, small if you compare them with the genome of uh, animals, for example, humans, we are having 3.3 into 10 to power nine base pairs, right? So they are having smaller uh, genome size. They are having only clo base pairs. So 3,75,000 bases only. Okay. The largest known viral genome is of bacteriophage G. So this is a new question for you. Uh, it is around 670 clo base pairs. Okay, so the genome of a virus may consist of DNA or RNA, which may be single standard, double standard, linear or circular. And in some cases, they also have fragmented genomes as we will discuss in the upcoming text. The genomic, uh, RNA strand of single stranded RNA viruses is called sense strand that is having some sense means they can be used as an mRNA means they can encode for proteins. Uh, they are called positive sense or plus sense means they can serve as mRNA which will encode for proteins or polypeptides. Then there is some anti sense uh, or the negative sense or minus sense uh, RNA also if they are single stranded RNA viruses they may have minus RNA, single stranded RNA, which mean a complementary strand should be synthesized, uh, which will act as an mRNA. Okay, so this minus sense will first produce a plus sense, and then this complementary strand, which is plus sense, will act as or serve as mRNA, uh, out of which the proteins or the polypeptides should be uh, synthesized. RNA genome of certain viruses may be segmented in nature. Now you can name two different type of viruses depending upon this fragmented nature of their genome or the segmented nature of their genome. So one is called as, so there are two type of viruses. One is called segmented genome viruses. For example, I told you influenza viruses and the second is called multipartite genome viruses which are having some examples as we will discuss. So one example is PCV, for example, I will tell you. So the RNA genome of certain viruses can be segmented in nature. The segmented genome are those which are divided into two or more physically separate molecules of nucleic acid, all of which are then packaged into the single viral particle. Now you need to remember this line. This is very important. And this will help you to differentiate these two different type of viruses depending upon their fragmented nature of genome. So these all fragments, if they are enclosed or packaged into a single viral particle, then this particular virus is called as segmented genome virus, for example, influenza A. If they are packaged into different, different viral particles, then the second type of segmented, uh, they are called multipartite genome viruses. So now the two uh, terms are very important and it is written that uh, multipartite genomes are also segmented, but each genome segment is packaged into a separate virus particle. So therefore, the segmented genome is different from multipartite genome. So there are two terms, one is multipartite, one is segmented genome. Segmented genome is present in influenza A, whereas multipartite genome is present. I'm writing the name because it is complex. So these are called PCV viruses. What is the full form? They are called penicillium. Uh, not given in your book, so I'm writing it here. Penicillium chrysogenum virus, C H R Y S O G N U M virus. Right. So this virus is actually belonging to a family, and uh, it is called.
thalassoviruses and they are also called as mycoviruses right so you need to remember mycoviruses if someone ask you mycovirus so these are multipartite viruses or multipartite genome viruses because each segment of their genome will be packaged into a separate viral particle this is the difference between a segmented genome virus and a multipartite genome virus so multipartite they are also called as polypartite genome viruses right so these discrete particles are structurally similar and uh, and uh, may contain the same component protein but actually because they are having different segments therefore their the size of their fragment can vary from one uh, viral particle to another viral particle of same type so their protein uh, are similar components capsule components are similar but size of their genome uh, often differ in size depending upon the length of genome segment which is packaged into a viral particle so multipartite genome for example pcv penicillium chrysogenum virus or the mycoviruses they are different depending upon their genome size because the capsid proteins are very much similar uh, to each other multipartite viruses are only found in plants so generally they are infecting plants they are generally do not uh, infecting other organism for example us or the animals right so you need to remember few things then we will move to another discussion so first of all we will discuss segmented genome viruses so here it is given as you can see this particular structure uh oh sorry so in this structure you can see this is influenza virus a so you can see the genome is present in the form of fragments but all the fragments they are present in the same virus therefore they are called uh, fragmented genome viruses other examples are given here so other examples of segmented viral genomes they are rio viruses arena viruses and bunia viruses right so these three families of viruses are also having segmented genomes now what is the significance of these segmented genomes so these segmented genome help for example influenza virus the viruses with the segmented genome have another mechanism for generating the diversity they can uh, as for example we have studied the gene transfer processes right horizontal gene transfer and vertical gene transfer in bacteria uh, by different processes and also there are mutations which can uh, be used to generate the diversity in the bacteria similarly these bacteriophages or viruses are having fragmented genomes which can be used to generate the diversity in these uh, viruses for example an example of evolutionary importance of segmented genome is the exchange of rna segments between mammalian and avian influenza virus for example there are two type of viruses two type of uh, these influenza viruses one is infecting the mammals second is infecting the um, birds avians right so they can exchange the rna segment between them and then they can give rise some kind of pandemic influenza or some kind of uh, infection right so that's how they can use the segments they can uh, interchange they can exchange and these segments can generate different kind of uh, diversity right so second is multipartite viruses so multipartite i tell i told you the example what is the difference first of all so multipartite viruses are those viruses which actually uh having segmented genome but each segment is packaged into a separate viral particle then they are called multipartite genome or polypartite genome so the viruses in this family is a uh, chrysoviruses are isometric variants which are characterized by this multipartite genome Uh, penicillium uh, penicillium uh, chrysogenum virus that is the short form pcv is a 
kind of this, which is present in this family, will D, and they are having uh, this type of genome. So each time, if you see uh, this particular virus can give rise to two particles in which the genome segment is packaged separately. So it is having this red color segment and this is having this green color segment, for example. Now, each segment which is packaged into this particular virus or this mycoviruses, uh, consisting of four monocystronic genome segments. What is monocystronic? Monocystronic and polycystronic are again two terms. Monocystronic is if a segment is having only one polypeptide coding gene, then it is monocystronic. If it is having more than one polypeptide uh, encoding genes in the same, uh, so these are called polycystronic or the, okay. So these are uh, different monocystronic genome segments. Then we will move back to, now you are able to understand what are mycoviruses, what are segmented genome viruses. Uh, now you need to understand the DNA and RNA can be single-stranded, double-stranded, or they can be linear, circular, or uh, something which is having broken chains. So linear double-stranded DNA with a single chain breaks. So all these types of genomes can be present in different categories or different classes of viruses. Depending upon RNA also, this, it can be a single-stranded or double-stranded, but uh, single-stranded may be linear, uh, positive sense or negative sense. Similarly, the double-stranded can be a linear, single-stranded, segmented uh, RNA or linear, double-stranded, segmented RNA. So we have discussed segmented uh, genomes. Now, Beside genome or these DNA and RNA, viruses can be classified depending upon their shape. So if it is having something like this, means these uh, capsid proteins are arranged in this fashion, then these are called helical symmetry. If they are having this kind of arrangement, then they are called icosahedral symmetry. So the animal viruses can be classified into two groups, helical and icosahedral uh, symmetry. Uh, except this last one, Fox per day, which is which are complex symmetry actually. Okay, so all viruses have a nucleocapsid that is made up of nucleic acid, which is packaged inside this protein coat. Uh, the symmetry refers to the way in which the capsomeres are arranged in the virus capsid. Maybe icosahedral that is having spherical shape, or the rod shape that is helical. Okay, so mostly there are two types of symmetry. One is the helical or this rod shape, and the second is spherical, that is also called icosahedral. So, helical symmetry is seen in nucleocapsid of many filamentous and pleomorphic viruses. Pleomorphic means they are having different uh, uh, shapes or different forms of these viruses. Helical nucleocapsid uh, consists of helical arrangement of capsomeres or the protein. Uh, polypeptides which are making the capsid coat of the particular virus uh, wrapped around the helical filament of nucleic acid. A typical uh, virus with the helical symmetry is tumor mosaic virus, TMV. Okay. Tobacco mosaic virus, sorry. Okay, so next one is uh, icosahedral morphology. Uh, this is the second one. So the example is, for example, T. Uh, class of viruses, for example, T4 viruses is a characteristic of nucleocapsid of many spherical viruses. Uh, icosahedron is a regular polyhedron with 20 equilateral triangular faces and 12 vertices. What it mean? So actually this has been asked uh, in. So what it mean by 20 tri acute triangular faces and 12 vertices? If you count these points, so these are 12 in these viruses. So these are icosahedral if they are having 12 vertices. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine, and the other side, this 10, 11, 12, right? So they are having 12, I, uh, 12 EQ, these vertices, and these triangles, if you count these triangles also, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and rest ten on the other side. So therefore, they are having twenty equilateral triangular faces. Uh, okay. So this is the basic characteristic of these ico icosahedral. Right. Example is T4 virus, which will infect the host E. coli, which are gram negative rods. Now, classification of viruses, we already have discussed this particular table and everything is written here. Based on the nature of host, viruses are classified into animal viruses, plant viruses, uh, bacterial viruses that are bacteriophages, and you can also classify them into the insect viruses that are called baculoviruses, as I told you in yesterday's class. Plant viruses are generally uh, polymovirus and uh, Gemini virus, for example, these are plant viruses. Animal viruses, for example, adenovirus, okay. <clears throat> bacterial viruses, I told you M13 and lambda phase uh, and other bacterial phases, which are bacterial viruses. And baculovirus are insect viruses. So you need to remember at least few names uh, for each of them. So depending upon their nature of host, they can be classified into four uh, or more different classes. They can be categorized. So next is bacteriophages, uh, right? So we have discussed this, that they have the bacteriophages or the viruses, which were first discovered in 1950 by two, uh, by F. Dot in England, and then in 1917 uh, by D. Hirely. So there are two scientists which independently discovered these bacterial viruses in 1915 and 1970s, okay, uh, in England and in France. We really use the term bacteriophage, that is eaters of bacteria, because they will eat the bacteria, they will kill the bacteria. Therefore, uh, the dehirally actually use this particular term, bacteriophages. So you can be asked who gave the term bacteriophages. So you need to remember the dehirally in France gave this particular term, uh, depending upon uh, he was able to observe the plaques. What is plaques? Plaques are those reasons. Uh, which is having, uh, which are having the lysed cells over the bacterial loam or the bacterial culture plate. Several morphological distinct types of phases have been described, including polyhedral, filamentous, and complex. Complex phases have polyhedral heads and uh, to which the tail and sometimes other appendages, for example, the tail plate, tail fibers, etc., are being attached. So we do not we have not discussed these other features of uh, bacteriophage. Uh, so we have just seen a simple bacteriophage, for example, lambda phase, which generally do not have these tail fibers and pins, right? So it is having a head and this particular sheath-like structure, as I showed you in. So I showed you lambda phase and M13, they do not have these tail fibers and pins like structures. But the E4 bacteriophage is having, this is T even phase, so it can be T2 or T4 or T6. So it is generally having a capsid uh, head in which it is having its genome. It is having a collar uh, or the neck region. It is having a protein sheath uh, to which there are tail fibers are attached and this is the base plate, uh, okay. So the tail plate or the tail fibers are coming out of this tail plate. Also, it is having tail pins, which are being used by the virus or this particular bacteriophage to attach over the bacterial cell surfaces with the help of these appendages called tail fibers and tail pins. They will bind to the cell surface 
with the help of tail pins, they will try to puncture the bacterial cell and then this particular genome will go through this particular sheath, which is a kind of tube and it will be injected into the bacterial cell cytoplasm as you will see in this part the structure. So suppose this is a bacterial cell or this is the surface of the bacterial cell. First of all, these tail fibers will help in the attachment of this uh, bac bacteriophage to this particular bacterial cell, host cell. Then these pins will puncture this particular uh, cell surface which is uh, generally the, in case of gram-positive bacteria, it is a peptidoglycan cell wall and cell membrane. In gram-negative, for example, in E. coli, because the lambda phage generally infect the E. coli cells, uh, so it will be an outer membrane followed by some uh, a thin peptidoglycan cell wall and then cell membrane or the plasma membrane. So it need to puncture the cell envelope so that this particular sheath region will go inside the cell and you will see it will act like a pump uh, and it is a hollow channel through which it will inject its genetic material inside the host cell cytoplasm. Now, depending upon the nature of uh, the genome, there are some examples given. So the first bacteriophage, which is sequenced, is actually phi X174, right? So it is single standard, it is having single standard DNA, therefore uh, it was easy to sequence. So if someone asks you this particular question, which is the first bacteriophage sequenced, so phi X174, because it was a single standard DNA containing virus. FD also having single standard DNA. Uh, if you name some double standard DNA viruses, then T phases and lambda phase. So lambda phase is having double standard DNA. I also showed you the structure of this particular uh, <clears throat> genome of this particular uh, bacteriophage. So lambda virus is performing lysogenic cycle in which first of all it will inject its genome into the bacterial cell then this will be circularized within the bacterial cell cytoplasm will be integrated into the bacterial genome and then when the cell division will occur it will go into the daughter cells right now this lambda phase is actually having double stranded dna this double stranded dna is having very important genes so actually there are uh, <clears throat> clustered, gene clusters. So the first cluster is having on the left hand side, it is having capsid component and assembly genes, which will encode for capsid proteins. So A, W, B, C, D, E, F, Z, all these will encode for different type of proteins, which will make the capsid or the coat of that particular virus that is called lambda phase and this will infect E. coli. Then there is B2 region, which is non-essential in this particular uh, bacteriophage. Then the gene cluster one is for early regulation. I told you there are five genes, C3 and C1 pro C2. C2 is not shown here. C2 will come here somewhere after pro. So C3 and C1 pro C2, these five genes are important in early regulation of uh, uh, lambda phase, whereas some genes for integration, excision, and exonuclease activity, they are performing the roles in the integration and excision of prophase into the bacterial genome. It is also having genes for DNA synthesis, late regulation, for example, Q gene, and lysis of that particular host, uh, which will be expressed at different time points in this life cycle of this particular bacteriophage lambda. Right, so this we have discussed yesterday also. Uh, there are cos sites or the complementary sequences which are single stranded, but uh, these are also uh, act, this, these will also act as recognition sites for the endonucleases so that these can be cleaved into uh, different different segments. So this one segment is actually uh, the 
genomic material for one bacteriophage because they will be produced in multiple copies during this rolling circle replication mechanism and later on they will be cleaved into the different segments and then they will be packaged during the assembly of viruses into the head region of these lambda fast right so this is a simple model you can understand that these viral genomes or double stranded dna is the genome part of lambda bacteriophage then some bacteria uh, sorry some viruses are, are having single stranded rna genome plus strand for example ms2 and double stranded rna as well it is present in phi6 so there are some examples given here now there are two type of life cycle of bacteriophage one can be lytic as i told you which is performed by by uh, uh, so here somewhere they have given the description also so depending upon their life cycle you can classify these viruses into two uh, types one is called virulent and one is called temperate so the virulent phases are those which will perform the lytic cycle whereas the temperate phases are those which will perform the lysogenic cycle for example temperate uh, bacteriophage lambda okay so lambda is one example of this type now we will discuss first is lytic cycle performers so all phases must carry out the specific set of reactions in order to make more of themselves so in order to replicate themselves they need to uh, do infection in different uh, organisms first the phage the bacteriophage must be able to recognize the bacterium that it can multiply in by the binding to the bacterial cell surface next the phage must inject its genome and the genome must be protected from the bacterial nucleases so this is an important requirement why bacteria uh, why it need to protect uh, its genome from bacterial nucleases because this capsid will help in the protection of uh, genome from bacterial nucleases right the bacteriophage genome must be replicated transcribed and translated to make the proteins or the capsid uh, proteins or polypeptides complete phage particles are then assembled into the new viron uh, virion particles and escape from the cell in order to infect the other cells now there are two type of life cycles one is lytic and then we will discuss the lysogenic life cycle of bacteriophage lytic cycle or the vegetative life cycle culminate in the lysis or the rupture of host cell so what is the difference between these two life cycles uh, one is leading to the rupture of the bacterial cell or the lysis of the host cell immediately after infection so and the release of numerous viral progeny so generally in this case in this first case uh, which include some virulent uh, uh, bacteriophages they are having generation time less than 20 minute because when they infect an cell in bacterial cell infect a bacterial cell they need to lyse that particular bacterial cell before it is going to divide right so therefore generally they have a generation time less than the generation time of that particular bacterial host and they will release numerous viral progeny viral uh, these bacterial viruses that are called bacteriophages exhibit uh, a lytic life cycle only are also known as virulent bacteriophages or they are called lytic phages because they inevitably causes the death and destruction of the host bacterium It means there is no gap once they infect the bacterial cell they will start replicating or dividing their genome and then protein synthesis is started with the help of enzymes of the host and then they will lyse the bacterial cell example of virulent phases are the t even phases so if you uh, take t2 t4 t6 so all the t even phases are light are performing the lytic life cycle the lytic uh, cycle consists of five steps 
you can remember them the trick a p s a r so you can write it so attachment penetration synthesis and then release so attachment uh, second is penetration as for synthesis a for assembly of viral particles and then finally it will be released out of the particular uh, bacterial cell right so the cycle begins with the attachment of the bacterial fast to a specific host uh, because there is a specific host because uh, viruses generally do have a narrow host range therefore they need to remember this they have they need to infect a specific host because this specific host is having some kind of receptors over its uh, cell membrane or the cell envelope on the bacterial cell wall after the virus attaches to its host it introduces its genetic material into the host cell that is called penetration which is the second step after penetrating uh, uh, it will release it will uh, release its genome into the bacterial cell cytoplasm when the bacteriophage genome enter into the cytoplasm it subvert the host nucleic acid and protein synthesis apparatus so it will uh, take over over the host machinery of synthesizing the protein uh, and nucleic acids so and will initiate the synthesis of viral proteins and dna so it will start replicating the viral uh, DNA and start making the protein out of it uh, from the mRNA. Then, as the virus protein are synthesized, they self-assemble into the viral component, such as head and tail and tail fibers. And then finally, uh, these will uh, finally assemble into a complete viral particle. So once the process is over, result into the formation of numerous intact uh, viral particles within the cell, host cell, Assembly step is completed, then viral proteins causes the lysis of that particular cell because there is uh, so many, because there is a large population of virus which is present inside the cytoplasm, it will create a kind of uh, pressure or, uh, from inside and it will lead to the lysis of that particular bacterial cell. Also, as you have seen in the case of uh, lambda phase, so the lambda phase is actually having some genes in its genome which are responsible for the lysis of that particular host for example sr so this sr region which is uh, present at the end of this particular double stranded dna it will encode for some proteins which will help in the lysis of that particular host uh, and the host is e coli in this case because this lambda phase will infect the e coli Now, there is one important uh, term that is called bus size. Bus size is actually the number of viral particles, the average number of uh, viral particles that are produced by each infected cell after lysis is called its bus size because after lysis or the bus cell will release the viral particles. So how many viral particles it is going to release is, uh, will be its bus size is a characteristic for each virus and often range from uh, between 50 and several hundred. So at least 50 and uh, it can go up to several hundred viral particles per cell are released when the cell will lyse or bust. Because this release of virus or virion is a more or less simultaneous process uh, after infection, they are uh, they are said to undergo a one step growth curve so so this is showing one step growth curve of viral replication in lytic uh, uh, bacteriophages or they are also called as virulent phases one step growth curve is a representation of the overall change with time in the amount of infectious uh, particles or viruses in a single cell that has been infected by a single viral particle. 
So you need to remember there is only one virus which is going to infect the single cell and then how many viral particles are being produced. Uh, so it is shown with the help of this curve, right? So initially, if you, uh, if you see, there is a decrease in the number of uh, log number of infectious units. So generally, there is one uh, uh, virus which will infect a cell uh, if it is not a co-infection, right? So it, it is generally a single virus which is infecting a cell. So if it is infecting a single cell, then the number will uh, go down because what will happen once the virus uh, infect a cell, it will release its genome into the bacterial cell cytoplasm and, uh, and there is decapping or uh, the removal of this capsid region take place. So for some time, you will see that the number will decrease. But, and then for some time, it will remain here because in this eclipse period, actually, the bacterial, uh, sorry, this viral particles are hacking the machinery of the host cell. They will start uh, replicating and uh, uh, synthesizing the proteins out of, uh, with the help of uh, machinery from the host cell. Okay. Then there is a latent period, which is including both eclipse period and this period in which the number is uh, growing. So it will show intracellular viruses, right? And then finally, a number will reach some, uh, this is called viral maturation phase in which number is increasing and then number will uh, reach a point. Uh, it will not increase beyond this point. And then finally, this particular number of viral particles will be released when the uh, host cell will burst or it will be lysed. Okay. So this is called the bus size, which is number of viral particle, which, were, which will be released out of single cell, single bacterial cell, which may have number uh, 50 to several hundred viral particles per cell. So with time, actually, they have plotted this particular curve. This is a one-step growth curve in the amount of infectious virus in a single cell that has been infected by a single viral particle. It begins with an eclipse period. So it is showing the eclipse period. You need to remember these terms. What is eclipse period? What is latent period? What is uh, actually happening in these particular periods? So eclipse period. The eclipse period is the time. Please underline this. It is the time when no virus or virion can be detected inside a cell intracellular means inside the cell there is no virus because it will release its genome and uh, the capsid region is being destroyed or uh, there is decapping at the end of eclipse period then uh, however the mature particle begin to accumulate intracellularly until they will be released by the cell lysis you will see that after this eclipse period then the number of viral particles will start increasing. They will start assembling themselves within bacterial cell. So this is intracellular. So this latent period is actually involving this eclipse period, but eclipse period is that period in which there is no visible growth uh, or you cannot detect any virus inside the bacterial cell or intracellular. At the end of this phase, then the mature fast particle begin to accumulate intracellularly until they will be released by the cell lysis. The time from infection until lysis, they, this is known as latent period. So this particular period is called, which is the time from infection up to their release is called latent period. So <clears throat> this is something very similar to the generation time, right? So it is a time during which, uh, during which no extracellular viral particles can be detected. So you need to remember this line also. In the eclipse period, there is no growth, uh, the no viral particles intracellular, but uh, it is the latent period in which you will find no extracellular viral particles, okay? So everything is intracellular. So if it is intracellular, then this is called latent period. This latent period do not include the time which is required for viral adsorption 
and anti uh, viral adsorption this is called adsorption because this is not absorption there are two terms absorption and adsorption adsorption is some particle is attaching to some solid surface for example some bacterial surface right now we are familiar with these terms eclipse period and latent period okay so the and one more thing that viral is getting adsorbed over bacterial surfaces it is not absorbed then there is second type of cycle that is called lysogenic cycle in which actually we have discussed this one because we have discussed the lambda phase in our transduction class so i told you this lambda phase is releasing its genome this is double stranded dna into the bacterial cell cytoplasm so bacteria is also having its genome this is bacterial genome or the bacterial dna or chromosomal dna then this phase particle or the dna from the phase wire uh, bacterial phase will be integrated into the viral into the bacterial genome so the viral genome and bacterial genome they are having some sites uh, these are called attachment sites so at sites at for attachment so at p that is the phase attachment site and this is at b that is a bacterial attachment sites so we will discuss this so first of all in the lysogenic cycle the viral dna is inserted into the host dna and replicated into the host dna uh, when the host dna will be replicated and this uh, inserted form is called prophase stage in which this is the genetic material of these viruses is inserted into the dna of the host cell or the host chromosome then it will be termed as prophase now there is another term uh, if it is having this prophase then the bacterial cell is termed as the cell that contain the prophase is termed as lysogen so when a cell become lysogenized occasionally extra genes carried by the phage get expressed into the cell these genes can change the properties or the phenotype of that particular bacterial cell and the process is lysogenic and this is called phage conversion process so first of all there is a virus or the bacterial virus that is called lambda phage it will inject its genome that is double stranded dna i showed you the structure of double stranded dna into the bacterial uh, cell cytoplasm inside the cell it so first of all it will be in linear form when it is present in the phage head but it will be circularized with the help of some cohesive ends that that are that were called pos sites into some circular form the circular form is required uh, if it will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome so it need to circularize then it will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome this is called prophase and the cell which is having this par uh, particular prophase is called lysogen so lysogen are those cells which are actually having these integrated versions of uh, viral genome into the bacterial chromosome so as i told you these are having two sites one is called pop dash one is called bob dash so the first one is called at, at p so attachment site of uh, e4 bacteriophage phage and these are called at b that is showing attachment site for bacteria now they will undergo some homologous recombination because you know this bacterial chromosome is circular also this is circular now then it will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome as you can see this there are two site one is here one is here so now when the homologous recombination will take place this side is called as bop dash so you can draw this so when this homologous recombination will take place they will cross like this right so this is called b 
op dash and the second one is called pob dash on this side now you can name them accordingly so this site will be called as attachment site on left hand side so at l and this is called as at r so now you will see there are four attachment sites one is attachment site p for uh, prophas b for bacteria l4 because it is present over left hand side r4 because it is present on right hand side so finally it will be integrated and this particular segment is called as prophas and the bacteria which is having this prophas is called phg so this is not s this is g okay so please correct this prophas is the integrated version of this uh, viral chromosome or genome into the bacterial genome so the integration of the circular lambda uh, genome involves the presence of attachment sites in the genome of both bacteriophage and the viral sorry bacteriophage is virus only and bacteria that is e coli the bacterium attachment site that is called at b and uh, consists of the specific dna sequences composed of three domains a b domain o domain and b dash domain therefore this is called bob dash similarly this is having attachment p site which is having three domains pop dash and when there is an so o domain is the core sequence because it is present in both now the homologous recombination will will involve uh, bop dash and pob dash okay you will make a cross here and then it will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome now so as i showed you the structure of this particular uh, virus so this is lambda phage genome so it is having as early regulation genes so it is also having c1 c1 is encoding for a lambda, uh, lambda repressor which will repress the uh, cycle okay so these there are five important genes which are responsible for early regulation c1 and c1 pro c2 so out of which c1 will be given here so lysogeny is maintained by the c1 repressor which is a repressor protein uh, encoded by the c1 gene of lambda prophage uh, the c1 repressor block the expression of genes responsible for uh, for the phage lytic cycle so see here because these genes are responsible for the lysis of the host so and other uh, also so what is the role of the c1 the c1 will uh, not allow the c1 will encode some polypeptide that is called c1 repressor which will not allow the uh, expression of these genes which will cause the lysis of host and therefore they will <coughs> allow the lysogeny so lysogeny is maintained by the uh, product of c1 that is c1 repressor protein c1 repressor blocks the expression of genes responsible for the phage lytic cycle under some condition the prophage initiates synthesis of phage protein that led to the uh, lead to the destruction of infectious cells and release of new uh, particles so in some cases uh, when this repression is over or there is some problem it can undergo the lytic cycle it can perform the lytic cycle when it need to release its viral particles outside of that particular bacterial cell okay that is the lytic cycle this process is called induction so the term prophage the term induction they will only come in temperate phases means those phases or those bacteria and those viruses which will perform the lysogeny okay so the induction is that particular process in which this phage will come out of this lysogeny and it will perform uh, a lytic cycle to release the viral particles so this is called induction induction occurs due to the damage in the host dna by some uh, for example uv radiation or something else so this is called uv induction for example or it can be some other uh, induction for example chemical induction right so the dna damage which is uh, caused uh, causes activation of rak a protein a highly specific coprotease 
so this RAK A protein is a coproteas. It will act with some proteases which are responsible for the degradation of proteins. So these protein will degrade the C1 repressor protein and therefore the lysogeny is over. Then the virus can move from lysogeny to the lytic cycle and uh, it will release the viral particles out of that particular host cell, right? So activated RAC protein A stimulates C1 repressor cleavage and then destruction of C1 repressor allows the lytic cycle to start. Once the C1 protein is degraded, then the lysogeny is over and then this particular virus will able to perform the lytic cycle. So this is easy regulation, but uh, you need to understand few things. For example, you need to understand the uh, genome of this particular virus that is called lambda fuzz. So it is having different genes out of which C1 is very important because C1 will encode a protein which is a repressor and this is responsible for uh, repressing the lytic uh, lysis of the host cell or the expression of other proteins, right, which are responsible for lysis. But once this RAC A protein will come and it will act with some proteases, it is able to degrade the C1 repressor protein and then uh, the FAS will express the lytic cycle. Mating of HFR cell with uh, that is lysogenic for uh, lambda with non-lysogenic F-negative uh, recipient is like infecting a non-lysogen with the lambda fast. So we had uh, we have discussed in yesterday's class that HFR cells are those cells which are having high uh, probability of transferring the bacterial gene uh, to some other uh, other cell or some other organism. So in the process of mating when the lambda uh, prophase enter into a non-lysogenic recipient which does not contain any lambda repressor, uh, transcription of pyrophase, uh, it will begin and the lytic cycle will be start. Thus, a non-lysogenic recipient receiving a prophase will lyse. Because it is not having this lambda repressor, therefore, it will be able to lyse this particular bacterial cell. This phenomena is called gigotic induction. So, <clears throat> Two things we have uh, discussed, one is induction, second is zygotic induction. So if you are using HFR and uh, you are infecting a cell, which is actually do not having this uh, lambda repressor, then it can stimulate the lysis of that particular cell because the lambda repressor is already not present. And this will term as zygotic induction. So everything is given in this slide. So first of all, it will show some lysogenic pathway. Uh, show the recombination with this chromosome or it can show the lytic pathway as well. So the, uh, this is called temperate phase. Temperate phases are able to perform both the pathways, lysogenic and lytic. In the lysogenic pathway, they will be integrated into the bacterial chromosome. In the lytic pathway, they will uh, synthesize their DNA. They will undergo DNA replication. So this is a capsule proteins and maturation assembly and then they will lyse the host cell and release the viral particle. Now, how you will count the number of viruses which are going to infect your cells? So this is generally done with the help of this Clark assay. So this we will uh, study in our next class. So I have given uh, something. In our previous classes, we have discussed a little about the Clark assay. So you want me to complete this or we should study this in our next class? What is your opinion?